Okay, so for the next 30 minutes-ish, we now are into um, the panel discussion. Um, so this is obviously recapping on where we are. I also like to welcome Michael uh, to the panel. And perhaps Good morning. Hi, Michael. I guess perhaps as you've not had the chance to introduce or present so far, it would be helpful to just get a, a little bit of an introduction about yourself and also the aims of Campaign for Better Transport. I think that would be quite nice to hear from. So, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so my name is Michael Solomon Williams. I'm the campaign's manager at Campaign for Better Transport. Um, we are the, if you like, the leading um, sustainable transport charity in England and Wales. So our remit is, is specifically England and Wales, although of course decarbonisation is a global issue. We've been around for 50 years. Um, previously, the office is previously known as Transport 2000, if you like. Um, so this is our 50th anniversary year. We've been uh, and doing a lot to celebrate that, including our best transport week. Our remit is um, is broad, so we cover um, all elements of transport that are sustainable, from rail to bus to um, to shared transport, and uh, to an extent active travel. Although, of course, we do we do leave the experts in that field to do most of that. In terms of mobility ways and collaboration, we've been doing an increasing amount with you, um, and we're very pleased to partner this year on our business travel toolkit called Better Transport for Better Business. Um, the range of work that I cover as campaigns manager is everything to do with external affairs. Um, so presenting at, uh, at meetings, conferences like this, taking our work externally to the media, um, an element of lobbying politically, um, and uh, coordinating the range of campaigns that we have on the go. Um, in terms of campaigns that we have on the go, um, latest news from um, Campaign for Better Transport HQ is um, rail fares and ticketing. So at the end of this month, um, we're bringing out a fares and ticketing report, which is the first um, of its kind for a good five years. Um, and this is something I'll go on to talk about. Um, but obviously, um, a big um, preventative to people traveling by by train is the complicated and costly nature of rail fares and ticketing. So that's that's our, our big news um, coming up this month. Um, but we, we cover a whole range of things, as, as you may be aware, although our, our kind of core, our routes are in rail and, and bus, um, we put out a quite influential paper last year on uh, on pairs you drive, so paper mile radio to charging, um, and that's obviously an extremely important um, issue to address with the with the coming black coal from from the uh, ice phase out, which I'm sure we'll come on to as well. So that's us and that's me. It's very nice to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. I guess just the follow up to that is, I mean, have you seen any upt uptick? in people interacting with uh, your organization since the recent announcements uh, on you know plans for drivers and the scrapping of hs2 i saw a blog uh, from yourselves about off the rails so i think that probably by its by its subject matter kind of gives your position in terms of where you are with hs2 yeah absolutely i mean uh, and we had a uh, just a short media thing recently which was uh, it was called seven policies for seven bins so i mean that, yeah there's been an obvious issue with the um with the range of um, slightly bizarre announcements from DFT, and well, you know, our, our feeling is um, is that um, unfortunately the DFT are very good, but they've been slightly hung out to dry, and they've slightly um, had their hands tied by um, by number ten to an extent. I don't know if we, we're getting too much into politics on this particular call, but uh, yeah, that's um, that has um, that seven policies for seven bins thing was was quite a um, you know it's just a media thing, but that did have a lot of um, a lot of positive response to it um, because there's there's definitely the strange new sort of sense in which. Transport weird has become a bit of a wedge issue um, in a way that it hasn't been for, for perhaps ever. Um, and yeah, we do face, although there is, there's a lot of good news to celebrate, I'm sure, sure some of which we'll cover today, um, as we're all aware, you know, it's um, we face significant challenges and it's um, if it's used as a political wedge, that's slightly slightly problematic. But um, we hope we'll get, we'll get through this slightly itchy period. Fabulous. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think Tim referenced political pollution. And I think we also saw from some of Lizzie's slides the, the division in terms of, uh, you know, red or blue in terms of uh, consideration of, of some of these transport challenges. Um, just, I, I, mean, I was busily scribbling down some notes from the three presentations we've heard so far. Um, and I like to make acronyms because it's kind of easy. So when I was looking at Tim, I mean, you mentioned your five pieces, Tim, targets, technology. You talked about collaboration. So I call that teamwork because I'm trying to go for five T's here to coincide with your name. Um, leadership in policy at a regional level, I'd say trust. Trust that at a local level, things can be delivered and it's for the benefit of you. And incentives, I, mean, I was struggling for that one, so I've gone for treats. Well, I think we've got five teams there. So I think there's some interesting stuff to build around that. And I think certainly when it came to Greg and uh, his Department for Sustainable Commuting, a lot of those things came to play. 
Um, I'm looking for behind the scenes, the questions uh, that are coming through from the poll. I can't actually see them right now, but uh, I'll start off with a couple of questions. Um, in terms of Lizzie, I'll maybe start with you yourself. Um, I th when I was scrabbling down the numbers, I could see two thirds. Two thirds seemed to be kind of a, a number that was coming through quite a bit in terms of people recognizing that we need to do more. You know, that, whether that be ourselves as individuals, uh, as businesses, as the government. Um, but but what is stopping, it, stopping us actually doing more? I think incentives came through a lot as, as something that needs to happen. Where is that money going to come from? Where is incentives really going to start to, to deliver the climate change that we need? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's not necessarily the case that there would be strong opposition to anything which could have a financial uh, implication for people if it can mean that people can make more informed choices. Um, so I thought one of the findings that is quite interesting, the um, where the support for the policy around um, pricing so changing product pricing to reflect how environmentally friendly products are um when when the financial trade-off was discussed the support actually increased um so it's it, it's too blunt to say um that uh, any type of financial incentive won't work um if it can help people make better choices um then perhaps it could be popular um but yeah the the backdrop of high concern relatively speaking about the economic situation um is definitely significant and yeah emphasizing savings uh, rather than people automatically thinking ah this is a change it might incur a cost that's really important so one of the figures was you know half of the public is saying i'm too worried about the cost of living crisis to even think about making net zero changes so not even got as far as thinking about the cost of them but just thinking about it at all because the cost of living crisis is taking up people's bandwidth if you like um i don't think i've quite answered your question there um but let, let me know if there's anything you want well to i guess i guess the thing that i'm taking from that is that um there is money on the table for people right now so you know there are there is obviously an element of incentive that we probably need but also you know if you think about sharing of of of, of the ride to work or indeed you know leaving the car at home and taking public transport to to the point trains uh, may may not always be the cheaper option but certainly when it comes to active travel and, and buses and the like two pound buses obviously fixed now until the end of next year we've definitely got the opportunity for people to save so it's people are saying i want to do more i'm really worried about cost of living there's there's ways for them to do that right now and yet uh, and yet people aren't doing what they need to do um, yeah. Secretary of State, have you got a, a view on terms of how we really deliver that message to get people to, to know there's hundreds of pounds on the table that they're, they're not uh, not recouping? Um, I don't know. I, I worry you might have guessed uh, from from the angle I took on the presentation. I worry about the way we talk about um, the change that we need to to affect. And I think we talk about individuals, choices and incentives, and it you don't have to go very far, as Tim was saying earlier, to come across a bad experience where that's enough to reinforce your view that, sorry, this doesn't, this isn't going to work for me. So I think this is a very short term and very at the margins strategy, which is why I think we need to really refocus how we do policy. So Commute Zero should have been one of the best things coming out of the, the pandemic from the Department for Transport, and it should have come out really quickly. And it should have been about how we are going to work together as businesses, local authorities and transport providers and commuters to deliver the services that get people to the jobs they want. At the uh, you know with the kinds of services they need and it's not going to be the same solution in every place we need that capacity on the ground to think through how it's going to work we need com you know there's companies like mobility ways that can provide insights into how um, best we you know package services what the gaps are how we fill those but 
but I just think trying to do this through um, messaging and appealing to people's uh, views on climate change will, will fall short, partly because, as people have been saying, you know, it's actually about the cost of living or convenience for businesses. It's about productivity and, uh, you know, making sure they've got a reliable workforce. Let, let's try and draw it together rather than, than, than atomizing it. Yeah. An interesting thing that um, also came through, Lizzie, I think you mentioned about, I think it was 71% of people need a car for their lifestyle. Um, it's interesting, that question, because actually I'd say, yes, you might need a, a vehicle for elements of your lifestyle, but do you need a vehicle for your work style? Life and work are two different things. And I think actually some of the reframing around this to actually talk about it as, you know, I, again, I, I'm a bit like a broken record on this subject, but we need more people to use their own car less. That's not to say that we're impinging on their lifestyle, but there's parts of your daily life where, and I think work style is one of those, where you could be doing, uh, using your car absolutely less uh, and obviously delivering cost of living benefits, but also climate change. Yeah, I I agree. And just to pick up on the point that you said about sort of people perhaps seeing something as infringing on their lifestyle, I think that's really important to win the public over. Um, you know, a personal opinion and also based on anecdotal evidence through talking to the public through things like focus groups um, and, and qualitative discussions, um, sometimes uh, things can be seen as infringing on people's personal freedoms when actually it's about giving choice and giving options to people and making people aware of the options but um the line can be quite fine where where people think hang on a minute i'm i'm being told what to do and um the car is a big expression of freedom actually and it's a, a big part of my life for that and and it can cause people to shut down quite quickly if they think that their their freedoms are being encroached upon um but as you say it's uh you know diff different modes for different journeys and different journey purposes um i do think that any measures need to acknowledge that people's lives are messy and complicated and particularly since the pandemic people have you know different working patterns uh, when we've spoken to the public in detail about their travel behaviors people are kind of uh fitting a, a lot more in doing um multi-stage journeys fitting in um you know picking up some shopping for mum and dropping child off at childcare, um sort of th thinking that the car is necessary to be able to do those types of journeys but as you say there will be other journeys that are perhaps less messy and complicated um where other ways of travel could work Absolutely. OK, so let's get into some of the uh, the questions that we got. Um, I mean, the the lifestyle element kind of links us to to the plan for drivers, because that's all about uh, the positioning around, uh, you know, we don't want to impinge on people's lifestyles. So therefore, you know, things such as and I see the top question here. Why is there such a backlash against the 15 minute town, um, local tra traffic neighbourhoods and the like? Um, it says here it seems to be positive for everything, shops and facilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this seems to um, go against sort of this view that uh, you know, a lack of freedom. Um, yeah, I mean, Tim, have you got have you got a view really in terms of low traffic neighbourhoods and what what's going on here? Why why are we not embracing these? Uh, yeah, hi Graham, and hi everyone again. Um, yeah, I'm really disappointed by this really negative narrative towards 15 minute or 20 minute neighborhoods, because actually, I can see that, uh, you know, there are huge other benefits to this um, that go way outside of this conversation about sustainable travel and, and, and CO2 emissions in clean air. Because actually, you know, one of the things that does seem to really um, great on voters is is the sort of um the the local high street just just going downhill and everyone going out of town so the idea that actually we could shop locally with local independent um uh, retailers for me is actually far more appealing than online shopping or this or the supermarket i know it feels like you know possibly i'm advocating going back to the 1950s but um you know i think in actual fact, there's, uh, you know, there's a really strong 
there's a really strong case, I think, to having services that are locally available within an easy walk or cycle. I think I mentioned this last time I spoke at this event, actually, this idea of thinking about travel, not in terms of the mode or how do we do a journey, but actually the, the wider benefits of structuring our whole system differently, i.e. thinking about how we live. So, for example, what if every child went to the, the local school because it was the best school for them? You know, if we think about all the car journeys that happened during the school run um, that could be saved because it was the local school that parents chose for their children or didn't choose, maybe it was just compulsory, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, we don't want to sort of roll back this idea of choice, but having great schools for great, great you know, f for everybody locally would make such a difference to how many cars are traveling around during the school run. And it's things like that. It's systemic things that, you know, the local school, the local shops and all your services, even places where you can go and do your work, not necessarily your company office. Are, are I think are, represent a great opportunity um, for changing the way that we live and changing the way that we travel. Thanks, Tim. Michael, do you have a, a view on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just want to pick up on the on the point about going back to the nineteen fifties and just to say, Tim, don't be ashamed of it. You know, I think it's. Um, I think there's actually Lizzie might have a, a, some info on this, but I think there's a really interesting potential socio political kind of middle ground here, where you've got people who are who are stressed about the whole situation, um, and you might. I don't know, you know, the, the poll might find that the majority of people would like us to, if you like, go back to certain elements of life in the 50s, and whether it's kids playing on streets or having a local shop or having a post office, whatever it might be. Chris Whitty made the point in his um, in his speech last year as um, TMO, and um, speech he was air pollution, as I'm sure everyone knows, here was his theme in his annual address in November. And, and he made the point that in the 1950s, there were four times as many um, people riding bikes. You know, it was the same on bus. The numbers were, were extraordinary. And we've also got the picture on light rail that before the 50s, the UK and indeed much of the world was covered with light rail networks. And, and now, we're, we're, you know, fortunately, there's a lot of interest in, in recovering some of that. But I think it's kind of OK. It's, it's a sort of social political, but sort of a philosophical, philosophical thing, if you like, to sort of accept that it's OK, um, if you like, culturally to have um, regrets to an extent. We had this experiment since the 50s. Some things went well, others didn't go so well. That's all right, you know, kind of accept that and say, we'll learn the lessons. Um, and I think there's a sort of, there's a more nuanced version of the transport decarb plan, you know, that can come out um, in the years to come potentially. Because um, you've got this, um, there's a, there's still in, in transport decarb, even in the 2023 update, there's still the, uh, the sort of, we don't need to change the way things are mantra in there. We can have transport decarbonisation while still driving, uh, driving while still flying, you know, flying on holiday while still driving everywhere. And um, that that does need to change. I think we do really need to say, perhaps this society in the fifties had good elements to it. Let's take the good bits and let's take the other things we've learned. Let's have apps and shops, if you like. Whatever, how would that look? And um, I think yeah. the much yeah. the much vaunted Waltham Forest, I think, came out top of the table of most um, livable place for families. Really, you know, just last week there was a timeout thing. You know. Um, it's, I think it's all right to sort of erase the good elements of what we might call 1950s life, if you like, in many ways. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, a, th a thread that's, uh, there's a question here from Kate Pangborn. So a, thre a thread there is linking the kind of low traffic neighbourhoods, but there's a, an interesting piece. And I think actually, Lizzie, if I, I, I think something here is interesting around public health. Um, it, actually, something came across to me just a couple of days ago. Um, that was written by uh, a paper about from the director of public health and really linking climate change and, and saying climate change is a public health issue. And I wonder in some of the questioning, um, economy and inflation are, are, are very easy for people to grasp, whereas some of the questions around pollution, environment, climate change, sustainability, it's a wider spectrum of words and topics that are perhaps harder for individuals to kind of um, zone in on the center and I think there's a really interesting piece here about climate change and public health it is a public <laughs> health issue that the government in other in other forms smoking you know that's 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 very much a public health issue which has been dealt with and has been improved over years and I wonder whether or not there's something here about really linking climate change and public health and recognizing that a fairer and greener transport delivers against a public health mandate I was wondering, yeah, from a panel perspective, what you think about that? 
just to re to reflect on that, um, I think that's a really interesting point because when we talk to the public and have detailed conversations about the environmental impacts of transport and future transport developments, um, sometimes there is a bit of confusion about local air pollution, nitrogen dioxide, particulates, that type of thing, and climate change, and it can be a bit conflated. And to your point, I think there have been some events um, which have helped people join the dots between the air pollution caused by the traffic and the negative impacts on health, particularly asthma cases, um, the case involving um, the very tragic um, death of a, a schoolgirl um, who lived uh, in South London and was uh, travelling, walking to school along a road which was very heavily polluted by traffic um, and it was directly connected um, her, the cause of her death, it was it was connected with the air pollution there. Um, but we haven't made such a connection with such gravitas, as you say, um, between public health and climate change. It doesn't feel like that has happened yet. Hmm. I mean, and perhaps I, part of it is that sort of slight confusion uh, about the differences between the two. Yeah, no, I, I think, in, I mean, Greg, you you started off with saying Department of Sustainable Commuting and then you said Department of Sustainable Transport. I mean, Department of Sustainable Health. I mean, how, how would you link link all these together to kind of really get that message across that actually this is a this is a, a significant public health issue? We already know we're walking into a, um, a an issue with electrification. Electrification's doing something, but it's not sorting congestion out and it's not sorting out um, public health when it comes to particulates. Yeah, I think it, it's difficult. I think um, it's a really interesting set of points. I don't think we uh, always are very good at projecting the multiple benefits that that come out of, of these kinds of interventions. On the other hand, it also gets very complicated for people to try and understand all of this. So I'd much rather we kind of had a, a, a bold approach which said, we are for better neighbourhoods. And this is what we mean by better neighbourhoods. And then we kind of explain what what sits behind that rather than, you know, it, I don't know, um, we, we call them low traffic neighbourhoods and um, it gets quite technical. And then, we're, you know, we love a little acronym. So we're into LTNs and so on. And I think it just alienates people, uh, you know, who we need to engage with. Having said that, um, I think we're in a, yeah, we're in a very difficult place for the next year. Um, I can't believe that we're living in a time where in a Department of the Transport publication, somebody's claiming that we are policing people's lives through this. I mean, if you want to go down that route, then every rule and regulation that exists in the UK is policing people's lives. This is, you know, this is our Department for Transport. I'm afraid we can't, we can't have that kind of um, public policy narrative out there. And I think it needs, it needs calling out. I was horrified that, mm. that, that that's been put out there. It's hugely damaging. And then there's a whole round of other, you know, um, fight back in order to just get us back to where we were on, on, on why we're doing this. So I think we just need a really clear agenda, better neighbourhoods. I like okay, and this I like is what that. better neighbourhoods look like, and it includes things like pavement parking. We need to, you know, we need to stop um, just imagining, as you said, Graham, that we can just accommodate the continued growth in cars, electric or otherwise. It doesn't solve some of the other problems that we've got to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Right. No, I like that. I like that. Better neighbourhoods. Okay, so, so link coming into sort of what what can be done. I mean, it's a pretty desperate state we're in, but there's there's plenty that can be done, and. If we can get those messages across and the incentives can come through. Um, the question at the top there from Abby Duff Walker, how do you suggest businesses generally encourage more sustainable commuting when the response from employees is that public transport is getting less reliable? I mean, I think one of the things that's come through is we need uh, better and cheaper transport, which is tough to deliver because it costs money. Um, but and, and you, I think you also mentioned, Greg, um, that the leadership role that public sector, local government needs to take because they are a significant amount of the emissions in their own right. But yeah, where, where do we think we need to be focusing efforts to really get um, to overcome perhaps some of these myths and perceptions, if they are, um, that um, employees can't travel sustainably? Anyone like to take that up? 
I, I would start again with partnership. Um, you know, we need employers to be able to work with the public sector to identify where the problems are. It's their sites, their workers, their labour market, like who can't get to, to where you need to get to, which routes are causing problems, who's going to solve that? It's not the businesses, not the individuals. It's going to be the transport providers and the local authorities that are going to need to sort out the kind of routing and 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 the priorities on particular sections, or it might just be that there's, you know, there's something missing. Um, and, and, you know, we shouldn't apologise if at the end of the day we can't find solutions for every everybody's journey that involves not traveling by car it's not that's not where we're we're going with this we're trying to make it easier for more people to more of the time be able to not use their their car or not use it by them by themselves so um yeah i but i think that has to be done kind of business by business local authority by local authority that, that, that's where the answers are Michael, have you got? Uh, you mentioned something about you, you've got something coming up about ticketing and fares. I mean, I did notice that Scotland have, uh, have, have, have reduced at least for a period of time. I think peak peak hour charging. I think on their on their ScotRail. Um, well, yeah, they've just, actually completely eliminated peak fares. Yes, as a trial really, from October. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're do you, that as part of your as part of your work, is, uh, do you have any recommendations around what's needed to kind of get to to deal with this paradox, which is we need cheaper transport. But there's there's a delivery cost. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got recommendations on on peak fares in our in our report. Um, there is, I mean, I think the question of of changing travel patterns is is a tricky one. I mean, uh, and I'm I'm living proof of the difficulty of of um, if you like remote working, and because we're currently in a shared office where we're all jumping around rooms, and everyone's in on a Thursday, um, and therefore rooms are are, are at a premium. Um, so you know, it's it's quite a sort of lumpy situation for everybody. And, and in terms of um, in in terms of Getting people onto trains, yes. I mean, fares. We we know full well that rail fares have gone up at twice the rate of, of the cost of driving over 20 years. So they do need to be cheaper. It's not. I should say it's not all about being cheaper. It's about simplicity. We've got a stat that a quarter of people have put off taking the train because it's just too confusing. You know, there has to be that that ease, um, which is comparable to getting in a car. Um, but I mean, going back to businesses. Um, you know, you can't persuade someone to, to take the train if the train service simply isn't there. You know, um, as Greg was saying, in terms of partnerships. There are cases with medium and large businesses where it has to be on a partnership basis, surely, NHS being a case in point. So when they move specialist services, often they don't make sure that there are transport um, networks lined up for the people who need those specialist services, whether it's, you know, ophthalmology, whatever it might be, neuro neurosurgery. Um, that actually affects people's ability to get to those services. So we need large businesses to take a lead, I think, in partnering with local authorities, ensuring that those networks are there. Um, other businesses, I mean, we have a, a toolkit called, um, I talked about, and um, we put out earlier this year, Better Transport for Better Business, that has some recommendations for things that and large and small businesses can do, ranging from, you know, cycle to work schemes and, and travel card loans and so on. Um, but it's really also, in terms of raising awareness, it's it's making employees aware of the benefits to their productivity. Um, so if a train service is there and people feel um, they don't want to use it, that you can make people aware of the actual benefits to getting work done and to time saving in certain cases. But it's 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 just not always the case that's possible. So it needs to be a bigger picture. We have to we have to have those medium sized businesses doing partnerships with local authorities. But then at a government level, we actually need targets and um, we need modal shift targets, basically. And that's that's what lacks from the transport decard plan. There's no actual target. There's no 27 um, percent. And uh, we've got um, I mean, Scotland is a great example in many ways because they've not only got this peak fare cut, but they've also got an actual target um, for modal shift away from cars by 20, um, 20 to 27%, um, which is something that England England doesn't really have. Wales has a recommendation. Um, obviously, a lot of good work going on in Wales. And we need to actually commit to that um, and, and embrace that target. I believe there needs to be a lot more done on, on car sharing and car clubs. Um, and going back to as Greg said, the the sort of ludicrous set of conspiracy theory proposals that we saw come out. One of them was the idea of compulsory car sharing. I mean, it's ludicrous. Um, you know, I think the reality is politically that that's that's appealing to a minority. And we did, and um, we did actually do a quick poll, um, not an Ipsos level poll, but a but a fairly significant poll in response to the plan for drivers, which showed that, in fact, it's it's not it's not in in tune with the public mood. Actually, um, it's worrying. It's a crazy situation to be in. But but I think. It's not actually what the public feels. 80% um, of people are concerned about congestion, yes, but actually four in five people who drive want an alternative. 
they want better public transport that's the, that's the real if, if you like will of the people to go on an old phrase and um, there's a desire out there for better transport um, provision to be to be in place um so we actually need i mean it, a lot of it comes down to government targets um, and so westminster needs to have a modal shift target that's a really big one i think that and, and tim that was your first point of your first five which are turned into t's targets and i guess but then businesses have targets of their own because they have esg reporting targets they have net zero targets carbon reduction plan targets so are we are we perhaps relying too much on government when actually all these large organizations that uh, potentially have some directives as well corporate uh, um, sustainability reporting directives coming through as well is it not just a case of accepting that the the overriding context isn't so great, but actually businesses just need to get on and get get stuff done and set targets of their own? Yeah, I, I mean, it's not easy, is it, to sort of keep subcontracting out the responsibility of who's actually responsible. I mean, there does need to be a central lead, as as Michael said. Um, but as I meant, also mentioned, you know, yes, there's very definitely going to need to be leadership at a local level, and there's going to be lead need to be leadership from organisations like Prologis that we saw in the video, um, where they're actually kind of uh, really setting the benchmark for what can be achieved in in this area. So, yeah, I, uh, the, the the problem is when when you haven't got a sort of hard and fast um, target to to kind of hang all of this on um whether that's a target for businesses or whether that's a target for um consumers uh it, it's difficult to sort of motivate organizations to go in one certain direction and and that's the challenge so um and there'll always it will always be a sliding scale of willingness to do things rather than a kind of a set of absolutes like you need to do these things in order to be compliant um so yeah it's it's a tricky one but i mean i think the whole point of today is really to, to think about what can we as a community do even when you know our world seems to be collapsing around us in terms of central government policy thanks tim question um that how, how do we overcome for, from trevor how do we overcome the driving to work as a perk mentality and that was interesting i think some of the things you mentioned there greg around um you know uh, you don't get free parking if uh, you, you know, if it's a single, single occupancy trip. I am aware of um, one one company in particular, irrespective of whether you get, say, a company car, and obviously that's still sort of a function of of work. Um, but if you live within a, a, a five mile radius of the office, you don't get a car parking space. It doesn't matter whether you get a, a perk vehicle, job need vehicle, or whatever. Um, what yeah? What do people think about this? The fact that we've got to. I mean, from a from your taxing perspective, Greg, there's there's more that needs to be done to uh, to stop stop this sort of perk attitude. So, even if you um, if you prefer the individual choice um, route to arguing for behaviour change, you still have the power to define the general conditions under which those choices are made. And while we continue to make things like parking uh, a non-taxable perk, and it is a perk, I don't have free parking at, at, at my work. If I decided I want to drive, then it's you know eight pounds fifty or whatever in the local car park. Um, you know, what, why why are we doing this? And if we are doing that, then why would we expect people to think we were serious about not driving to work as a as an option? You're 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 appealing people to give up something free. Uh, to to do something else, and you know, then then we say, oh, public transport feels like it's expensive. Well, it's not surprising, is it? <laughs> you know, with the, so I, I, you know, I think if we want to really take it seriously, then then we would have to start looking at at the underlying incentives. Um, I don't I don't see why that would be problematic. There's quite a lot of people who who um, you know fall into that category. You can go down the the route of the French business tax instead if you want um the workplace parking levy in nottingham is an equivalent to that for large em employers if you want to keep it keep it simple um but yeah i just feel very strongly if you want something different then you've got to change the conditions where you're asking people to make the, the choices otherwise it'll look very much like today or worse 
Has, uh, has that, is that a question that's ever been asked, Lizzie, um, to the general public? I mean, you, you mentioned Nottingham and the workplace parking levy. Obviously, Bristol looked at it and decided against it. Um, could, should, could or should that be something that's uh, explored by Ipsos to kind of really understand, particularly under this backdrop of two thirds of people want to do more? OK, mm -hmm. well, let, let's test some of these things then in terms of your ability to your your, your feelings around that. Yeah, we've not yet done polling on that level of specifics um, around, yeah, w work incentives to, to drive. Um, I guess um, another reflection on that is uh, it's public and private sector are very different in terms of what drives organisations, like organisational level behaviour change. And I guess that's quite important to remember because... Um, companies and businesses like showing off about what they're doing and all the great things with ESG but uh, the motivation might be quite different for the public sector um, so that's I don't know what the answer is but that's a challenge to consider as well. Fantastic right well we've reached the end um, thank you for all your contributions thank you audience for all the questions I think if there were questions that weren't um, answered I, I, I believe that we'll try our best to come back to you on some of those questions uh, after the event but uh, thank for now thank you panel and uh, Basil over to you